Okay, Chicago Audubon Society's mission is to connect people with birds and nature through educational programming, field trips, advocacy, stewardship, and research. And our vision is that all communities in our region will understand, value, and protect birds, other wildlife, and habitat. And we rely heavily on the members of our community like you to keep us energized, nimble, and effective, especially during times like these. Uh, and you can check out our website for all kinds of great content. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to um, go into the program. And um, the first segment of our program will be a, like a birding guide to the three sites that we're talking about today, Northerly Island, McCormick Place, and the Burnham Wildlife Corridor. And um, to do that birding guide, we're going to have first uh, Doug Stotts uh, of the Field Museum. Um, and also Josh Engel of Red Hill Birding. So the two of them are gonna be talking about uh, birding in these locations. So um, um, we can just hand this over to Doug. Uh, Doug, if you wanna just share your screen. Hey. Okay. Oh, there he is. And uh... oh, Doug, where are you? Okay, hi there, Doug. Hi, Doug. Hey, Doug. Voila. Okay. Um, so, oops, we got carried away. <laughs> so, we're going to talk about the South Lake Front from Northerly Island down to Burnham Nature Sanctuary. Um, this is a close up of the uh, wildlife corridor, which stretches from the Burnham Nature Sanctuary at 47th up to the McCormick Place Bird Sanctuary, um, just south of McCormick Place. It's on both sides of the of Lakeshore Drive in different parts of it. And um, you can see I have a list starting at the south end of eight different birding areas within the, the corridor going up as far as Northerly Island. Um, so this is a broader view that includes um, Northerly Island, east of the Field Museum, and Burnham Harbor, which um, is adj adjacent to McCormick Place. Um, one thing I should say is that the Field Museum has a long-term study looking at birds hitting buildings at McCormick Place, and um, Dave Willard regularly checks the area between there. So basically this area is for migration. There's very little that breeds in the area and it tends to be slow in winter. And this is getting getting ahead of me, okay? Uh, I think the fall is a little bit better than spring and October is probably the best month overall. In winter, it's all about um, owls. There are in good years, there are snowy owls. There can also be long-eared and short-eared owls and there can be rare gulls in the harbors and um, off, off of Northerly Island. Um, each of these areas is a um, hot spot in eBird, and so this is the number of species that are known from each of them. You can see Northerly Island is the most diverse with 255 species. Um, there are roughly 300 species in the whole region have been recorded, including some, some significant rarities. I should say that McCormick Sanctuary and Northerly Island are the most heavily birded of these areas. So these numbers are not necessarily indicative of how, how good they are for birding. The area between 39th and 43rd is not an eBird hotspot. And so I don't know how many species have been recorded in there. Um, access, you can get metered parking at Northerly Island at 31st, at Oakwood, which is 39th, and at the south end of the Burnham Sanctuary, which is 47th. So it's fairly easy to drive here and park. The, currently, the, I think the parking is $2 an hour. Um, the Lakefront Trail runs through the whole area, so you can get there by bicycle very easily or walking from either the north or south. Uh, the 146 bus goes to the Adler Planetarium, so you can, um, even though I can't spell close, 
you're close to uh, north of the island. One thing you should keep in mind, we'll see what happens with, I don't know what's going to happen in terms of uh, fans for the Bears games, but typically when there is a Bears game going on, you can't access the areas from 31st Street North. So that means several Sundays in the fall, which is a real pain in the butt. Okay, so at each spot, there are a slightly different set of things. At Northerly Island, it's good for migrants, especially uh, sparrows, water birds, including shorebirds. You can sometimes see them on Northerly Island proper, and they also use 12th Street Beach, although 12th Street Beach is not nearly as good for shorebirds as it used to be since they put in the, uh, the uh, concert facility. There are breeding grassland sparrows there. It's uh, one of the better spots for snowy owls and short-eared owls during migration can be pretty common there. Burnham Harbor is mostly migrant waterfowl, gulls, swallows. That's most easily birded from the Northerly Island side of things. At the McCormick Place Sanctuary, this is probably the best spot for migrant land birds along this whole area and you know, good numbers of sparrows and warblers. At 31st, uh, waterfowl and gulls are present and it's, it's a place that in the recent past has been consistently good for snowy owl. The Burnham Wildlife Corridor is mostly about grassland birds. It's uh, restored grasslands and um, dick sissels and savanna sparrows breed in there. I've had Henslow sparrows singing in the summer there. And migrants are use it heavily, especially sparrows. Oakwood at 39th Street is probably the best spot to see migrant waterfowl. You're raised up a little, it sticks out a little into the lake, and it's a good spot to see things like scoters and long-tailed ducks and other, other waterfowl as they go by. And then Burnham Nature Sanctuary is good for migrants, especially woodland species. Um, it does not have any water at all, but it's uh, got a good set of trees and some restored grasses in there and is, is pretty birdy during migration. And this is the one rare bird that I had a picture of from Burnham Wildlife Court or from this area, which is a brant that spent about a month out on Northerly Island in the museum campus in 2016. So I will turn things over to Josh Engel, who has, will tell you more about the Northerly Island area and show you some bird pictures. All right, let me share my screen. Um, Doug already showed a map. Thanks, Doug. Um, yeah, so Doug already showed a map, but here's another one that uh, I mocked up very quickly. Um, but you can sort of get a sense of where the city of Chicago is compared to our downtown area compared to where we're talking about. Um, like Doug mentioned, I'm mostly going to be talking about Northerly Island, um, which is a place that I visited very frequently when I worked at the Field Museum uh, starting in 2010. And Northerly Island has changed quite a bit over the time period between when I started going there in 2010 until now. Um, the nature of it has changed really pretty dramatically with a lot of restoration work and um, sort of construction work that's gone on the, to change the nature of the park. Um, this is a photo, a sort of before photo from what it looked like uh, probably in about 2001 or, or excuse me, 2011 or 2012. Um, I should mention that before Northern Island was a park, which wasn't all that long ago, it was a air, small airport that served downtown Chicago. And um, even when it was an airport, birders would go and stand on the uh, balcony of the hangar building to look especially for snowy owls. And I started doing that in the mid-1990s and actually just checked my records. And uh, I saw my first ever snowy owl there uh, in December of 1995 as a 13-year-old. Um, but I started going back there a lot when I worked at the Field Museum in the, uh, starting in 2010. And it was a wonderful park. It was pretty simple. It wasn't anything fancy, it had, but you could see that it had a lot of this nice tall grass. 
You can see it both in the foreground of the photo and um, a little bit farther back. And it's also a place that has spectacular views, both of the lake and of downtown Chicago. Um, and you can sort of see, you can see uh, um, the Field Museum sort of in the center of the photo, Soldier Field, so just to get you a little bit oriented. But um, I think of it really as a place, good place to see grassland migrants, especially. Um, all, the, all the bird photos that you're about to see I took over the years at Northerly Island itself. Um, and uh, the Cedren is a, an uncommon breeding bird and migrant in the Chicago area. And that's one of the birds that really like that sort of tall, thick grass during migration at Northerly Island and in the Burnham Wildlife Corridor as well. Um, they're famous for that sort of split-legged pose. Um, bobolink and Northern Harrier, are, that's a, a fall plumage bobolink. So it doesn't look like the, the black and white males that you may uh, be more familiar with from summertime. but when they pass through Northerly Island in the fall, that's what they look like. Harriers regularly um, would pass by along the lakefront and Northerly, because it's the preferred habitat for them, uh, they would sometimes stop in to hunt um, voles and mice and um, those sorts of uh, uh, mammal prey, especially in big years. Um, you get some interesting backgrounds there too. This is a um, short-eared owl. Uh, looking south from Northerly Island, I guess. Um, Short-eared owl is another grassland bird that migrates along the lakefront and Northerly Island was always a good place for them to stop in because they like the habitat there. Um, and they would even be there occasionally in winter. Um, the birds that birders I think get most excited about at Northerly Island um, are the grassland sparrows. Doug, Doug mentioned this. Um, Another thing that Doug said is that it's probably better in the fall for migration, and that's something that I agree with, and uh, that's the best time to see these sparrows. These are all elusive, uh, shy sparrows that like thick grassland, that can, and they can be very shy and difficult to see, but Northerly has always been a very good place to see them. It's a little bit more difficult now um, that not as much of the grass is accessible uh, because of the, the habitat changes there, but it's still pretty good for them. That's a uh, LeConte sparrow on the top left, uh, Nelson sparrow on the right, and a uh, Henslow sparrow in the bottom left. Um, it's also just a good place to see assorted other strange things. Doug showed a brant, which is the rarest goose to show up there. But on the left hand side, you can see a cackling goose with a Canada goose. If the cackling goose is like a mini Canada goose. Um, they stopped in there occasionally because they were attracted by the flock of Canada geese that's there all the time. Um, soras and other rails would show up there occasionally. This was a sora that, um, as I was walking through the grassland, it just walked out onto the rocks in front of me. Sort of neat to see a sora in migration in a, in a place like that. Um, birds are not the only things that migrate through northerly or the Chicago lakefront. Bats do as well. This is a red bat that I happened to come across uh, roosting during the day, I think in September or October at Northerly Island. Um, you can see it sort of covering its eyes from the sunshine, it looks like. Um, of course, there's a lot of the lakefront has public art displays. I think this is called Daphne's Garden at Northerly Island. If you look carefully, you'll see a clay colored sparrow sitting on the, the statue right in the middle of the screen. Um, of course, birds will use whatever perches they can find sometimes when they need to. I guess the sparrow was in the grass and it wanted a better view of its surroundings. And so it hopped up on the statue to, to get a look around. Um, we've mentioned that, that the areas are probably best during migration, but there are still interesting birds to be found there in summer and in winter. Um, Doug and I were actually leading a walk some years ago in the summer. This was actually about Burnham Wildlife Corridor, and we came across a Dixisle nest. So these are, these are Dixisle chicks in a nest uh, just south of McCormick Place that we, that we were lucky enough to come across. And in winter, um, besides things like snowy owls that we mentioned. I think Gustavo is going to talk more about snowy owls later. Um, in years with good vole populations, uh, you might get a northern shrike, which um, in my memory only spent a winter at Northerly Island once. This is an amazing photo by, by my friend Steve Huggins um, at Northerly Island of that shrike that spent the winter there eating a vole. And uh, a lot of these uh, raptor raptors along the lakefront of that part of the lakefront um, their populations in winter are tied to vole populations. So in years where there's a lot of voles, you can get quite a few wintering raptors like long-eared owls, snowy owls, harriers, red-tailed hawks, kestrels, shrikes, um, and all of those sorts of things. So 
Um, it's not a place that you want to totally ignore in summer and in winter. And then Doug mentioned Brant as one rare bird that's shown up there. Um, but it's been a place that's attracted quite a few rare birds over the years. That's a western meadowlark on the left, which is a very uncommon migrant on the lakefront, but much rarer is the brewer sparrow on the right that spent one or two days there um, in October of 2012, I believe, and is only one of uh, four or five that have ever been seen in Illinois. So that was a, a popular bird. A lot of people came down to Norley to try to see it, but it was uh, elusive and it was only there for a short amount of time. Um, so that's the end. I'm going to unshare my screen. Okay, great. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Doug and Josh. Yeah, that, that was uh, a great look at these two, at these three wonderful places. Um, and um, I think that, you know, in Chicago, we're lucky that the park district really recognizes the value of the public lands along the lakefront. Um, and these spots that we are talking about, um, all three of them, you know, have been developed in my birding lifetime, you know, like probably starting in the late 90s uh, with McCormick Place and then um, Northerly Island. You know, we all, uh, many of us remember the very dramatic moment when we woke up and uh, Mayor Daly had carved these big X's in uh, Meg's field, um, uh, which was a pretty strong statement of uh, his support for these natural areas. And, and the, this whole, um, the whole, all the lakefront bird sanctuaries really expanded uh, under his regime. And then um, the further expansion down the lakefront in the Burnham Wildlife Corridors. So, uh, you know, I think it's a great place for us to really realize how much lakefront lawn has been turned into lakefront bird habitat. You know, it's looking back over it, it's, it's really kind of a phenomenal, um, phenomenal accomplishment. So we're going to hear a little bit about um, a habitat management, habitat restoration at these sites, and then also not only the habitat management and restoration, but this great effort to engage, um, you know, more, uh, more of the people of the city in um, in these great places. So we're going to hear from Ted Gross um, of the Chicago Park District. Hi everyone, let me just set up my screen. Um, okay. All right, can everyone see three nice pictures of Northern Island up there right now? All right, fantastic. So yeah, I'm Ted Gross. I'm a program specialist for the Burnham Wildlife Corridor uh, with the Chicago Park District. Uh, my office is at Northerly Island, and I'm also kind of subbing in today for uh, Tish Daniel, who is the um, center director for Northerly Island. So, uh, and yeah, I'm gonna talk, site management isn't entirely my expertise here with full disclosure, I'm more on programming. Um, I'm gonna do my best to kind of talk about some of the kind of idiosyncrasies and some of the unique qualities about uh, wildlife and natural areas management at Northerly Island. But first, um, just a couple things to address. If you're trying to get out to Northerly Island, uh, I know our lakefront parks are not as accessible as they were pre-COVID, um, but they are still accessible, just not really for parking. Um, so you have to park somewhere outside of there um, and then you can bike or walk into them. Um, I know sometimes the city has had to do a, sort of an extra closure. I heard a little bit about Montrose uh, with that um, when big crowds have developed. Um, typically, I don't know what's going on with Montrose right now, but typically it's only been like a day when it's happened um, and then it's back open again for pedestrians. So I encourage you to come, uh, just keep it moving. If you can wear a mask, please, um, and go see some birds. The areas are as beautiful or more beautiful as they've ever been. Uh, so, Northerly Island, it's a cool place. We do a lot of cool things out there. Um, right now, if it were a normal year, we'd be running some kayaking, and you can see in the picture, um, which is a great way to kind of get out and explore Northerly Island in a way you couldn't typically. Um, you can kind of get in the water by the waterfowl if you want. Um, we do programming all year round. In wintertime, we have polar adventure days uh, where Flint Creek, uh, who is a bird rescue in the Chicago area, uh, will bring um, a series of raptors and other native wild birds um, to view. Uh, and you can kind of have a dialogue with them and talk and ask questions. 
Um, and it's always a cool place to see birds really up close and uh, get to know them. So uh, when programming returns to the park district, check us out uh, and I hope you, you come to some of those things. So Northerly Island specifically, uh, we've kind of already seen these maps a little bit. Burnham Park extends from Northerly Island uh, up here and goes kind of all the way down to uh, actually about Hyde Park, but we're gonna talk today only about East 47th Street here at the Burnham Nature Sanctuary. Um, one of the most unique things, and I pull this picture up, this is kind of the baseline where I like to start when talking about the unique qualities of natural areas management on Northern Island and Burnham Park, um, which comes down to the fact you'll kind of see in this image here, we have where there should be Grant Park and there's a lagoon. Right? This is maybe 18, late 1800s Chicago. Um, and that's because Northerly Island and most of our lakefront on the south side is actually entirely man-made. Uh, the natural lake shore would have come into Chicago um, a little bit further than it, it shows today, closer to the train tracks. Um, and so a lot of the land that we're talking about isn't actually, it wasn't historically a prairie or an oak savanna or anything like that. Um, it is an entirely man-made island, meaning the soil underneath uh, is going to be a lot of infill. It's going to have bricks in it. It's going to have some great topsoil, some sandy places. It's a very strange mix of things. Um, the, this photo here uh, is taken around the 1933 World's Fair, um, which is what the island itself was built for. Um, kind of looking at it today, it's undergone a lot of changes. We talked a little bit about how after being a site for the 1933 Century of Progress Fair, um, the island was turned into an airport. Uh, and then in 2000, the famous bulldozer incident happened and it was from there turned into a park. Um, an important redevelopment since then is that around 2013, uh, a new construction began where we totally redeveloped the island. It was initially completely flat um, going north to south, uh, and we added in the lagoon uh, and the hills and all this beautiful stuff, the, the loop pathway um, based on a design by Jeannie Yang. Um, and the island has kind of become what it is today. Uh, going back to this idea of it being not a natural, natural area, it's been kind of cool to see it in the past few years if you've been there since 2015 when it reopened. Um, to really see a very heavily planted space where you can see exactly where someone put in a um, cut plant or a number of plugs. And it looks very gardened to something that this year especially, um, to me, really looks like a true natural area. Um, but also important to keep in mind is it means that everything in the Burnham Wildlife Corridor and Northerly Island is planted, right? These are not natural spaces with natural incidentals. When I've worked in some of our more uh, restorations on say the southeast side where there were historic wetlands, um, we sometimes find incidentals like orchids or um, even amphibians and things that have been living there through pollution, through environmental change, through whatever development over time and are still there. Uh, when it comes to Northerly Island and the lakefront, Everything is there somewhat intentionally. Um, and the only things that aren't there intentionally tend to specifically be invasive species that we don't want. Um, so it's just a different way to think about natural areas management, right? It's entirely urban here. We're not talking about a pristine place or even a place that we're trying to build back to something that it once was. Here we kind of have an opportunity where we're trying to build it um, into whatever a natural area could be, right? So it's a very human effort uh, here. Um, step back a moment. So looking at this map on Northerly Island, I know one of the big questions that's come up lately has been um, on the path, sorry, kind of over here on the Lake Michigan side. Um, I'm sure this year anyone who's been out there has noticed it's no longer there. Uh, it was washed out. Again, one of those issues with being a man-made island, it means that um, there wasn't a deep root system already intact that we had to work with. Uh, it means that uh, when the waves came in about a year or so, after, not even actually about a couple months after the area was completed, um, it knocked out some of the pavement on this side. 
uh, and unfortunately it's been just too difficult and costly to replace those. So a call to sacks been built in. It's sad news. I don't think anyone's happy um, about it, uh, but it's sort of what it has to be to preserve the rest of the island uh, in the nature natural area. Um, but it's also good news for birders. Uh, we don't have a trail there anymore, but uh, there will be more plantings going in over there. Um, it will be restored into further natural area, which means better food for our birds um, and the other wildlife at Norgley Island. So while it's kind of sad you can't loop around it anymore, uh, hopefully it will not impact your, it'll only be a positive for your birding experience um, and there'll be just that much more natural area in that space. Um, so we're going to kind of move on from Northerly Island for just a moment, um, and they'll have some questions at the end if anyone has any. Uh, I want to kind of take a look at another unnatural natural area, uh, the McCormick Bird Sanctuary. Um, I only have a little bit here, but this is a picture of the McCormick Bird Sanctuary, and it is unnatural a natural area as can be. It's actually a parking garage. Um, underneath here is a parking garage from McCormick Place. Um, it was originally built uh, as a totally sod and just turf rooftop garden. Um, and it was a nice first attempt at doing something green, environmentally friendly. Um, but the people at McCormick Place decided to work with the Chicago Park District to sort of do a better job at it. Um, and so we've tried to find a way to make it a uh, actual natural area, again, on top of a parking garage. Um, and this has some difficulties, just like in planting Northern Island, you have to think about planting and finding seeds for every kind of species you need to make this a complete ecosystem. Um, here we have to kind of rein that in further. Uh, the topsoil here is only three feet deep. Um, prairie plants have root systems that only begin at three feet deep. Typically, there's going to be a lot of species going as deep as 15. Um, and not to get too ahead of myself, this is one reason why they can be very good for lakefronts, um, because they can hold that shore intact, but uh, anyway, stepping aside. Uh, so we can't pick the wide variety of species that we might want here. Um, we have to look at unique areas of prairie ecosystems that have short so topsoil layers like this. So you're looking at things like dolomite prairie, um, or other very shallow root system prairie ecosystems. Um, predominantly, some of the species you're going to see here are going to be uh, cup plant, which can grow very tall and has somewhat deep root system, but here it's managed okay. Um, a lot of bee balm um, or, or wild bergamot uh, and, and some grasses as well. Uh, this picture is shown in kind of early July. If you were to go there right now, and I really encourage you to go ride a, a bicycle down the lakefront path, and it's a just a turn off um, just south of McCormick Place. Um, you can go there as a gate. You're welcome to open it. It's just a push swing open gate. Go walk around. You're going to see it's going to be full of yellow flowers um, and a lot of purple right now. Um, and it is a great place to see a wide variety of birds. I think Doug Sots did a uh, I had a nice graphic there that after Northerly Island, this is going to have the second greatest um, biodiversity of birds uh, on this uh, within Burnham Park. So it's sort of a second view kind of looking out of the lake here. Um, but part of the reason why I'm sure it also has so much diversity is that in addition to just the rooftop garden, um, the area around it also has a lot of additional biodiversity. Um, where we can't do deep plantings there. Um, we have done it a little bit to the south. Um, and so you go there, you'll find some of the only examples of shrubland, um, sort of areas with a lot of lower bushy plants, which tend to have a lot of berries, which are good for birds, um, as well as a little bit of an oak savanna type, I'll say, habitat, um, an ecosystem south of there too. So it's a cool place. Again, I encourage you to check it out. Um, it's fun to go walk around. Uh, part of the reason for this also is that we have this map here as a nice example. Lots of these mulched trails. So in addition to the lakefront trail, which is our blue line here going all the way south, uh, we have a variety of mulch trails you can kind of get off and explore. And I encourage you to please get off the main trail and go walk and explore. If you got a bike, please don't bike on the mulch trails. Um, just uh, walk your bike along the side of you. Um, which is a good quiet thing to do if you want to go see birds. 
now the Burnham Wildlife Corridor is a cool place for another reason, which is that it extends on both sides of Lakeshore Drive. Uh, so in addition to just the lakefront areas here, there is also some spaces on the western side of Lakeshore Drive. All are accessible, and they should be accessible, uh, including right now. Uh, one of my favorite spaces is the Burnham Nature Sanctuary. Um, I'm sure others will, uh, it's not the most diverse space in terms of bird species. But one of the things I kind of enjoy about it is it is actually kind of loud. Um, it's right next to a lot of traffic. But for me, that means that I can get up close to birds and wildlife in a way that I can't in a quiet space. Um, they don't always hear you coming. Um, and it's also outrageously diverse. Within this tiny space down here, we have, um, I'd say some, a little bit of grassland, not quite enough for me to call it a prairie, um, but definitely some beautiful oak savanna uh, and woodland going all, stretching all the way up here, um, all packed into this tiny space down there. Um, so it's a really cool place to see a wide diversity of, of ecosystems like that. Best of all, it's not really well known. Um, when I'm there, usually there's one or two other people there and that's it. It's not on the lakefront trail. You have to know it to find it. Um, parking to get to these places, especially right now, there is parking lots available. As you know, right now, um, those parking lots are closed, including on the western side of Lakeshore Drive. Um, and that's unfortunate, but there is plenty of street parking available. Um, to get in here, I would encourage you to park around East 35th Street over here um, by the Douglas Tomb site. There's plenty of street parking, the Great Migration Bridge, footbridge. You can walk right across or ride a bike over to access these areas. Um, and around East 47th Street here, Cornell Drive has some street parking on it too um, that you can use to easily get in. Otherwise, I think it's been mentioned if you have a boater's pass, um, you can typically use those to use the boating parking lots within there. Um, if you don't, unfortunately, they're not accessible to you right now, but uh, um, these are the best ways I've found to get in, uh, which you can do and should do. <laughs> Again, as long as you're just keeping it moving and being respectful of others during the pandemic. Uh, and I'm gonna kind of wrap it up here and talk a little bit about one last really cool project that uh, the Park District, the Field Museum and the Nature Conservancy has all been working on, and this is Roots and Routes. So talking a little bit earlier about developing land in a natural area, the first question is usually how do we make this space the best for the wildlife? Um, but we're in a city and the wildlife isn't everything around us. Um, a second big question is how do we make this natural area best for the people who live around it? Um, and if we really want to create a natural area that people care about, they're gonna keep coming back to, that they're going to feel is a part of them and hopefully in the future, um, they're gonna to continue to support in any way they can. Uh, for the longevity of it, uh, then we need to build way, a myriad of ways for the public to engage in park. Roots and Routes is one attempt at doing that, and I think it's been a pretty cool and successful one. Um, our mission statement is that it's a collaborative project aimed at creating and sustaining the longest stretch of lakefront natural area within the Chicago Park District system, the Burnham Wildlife Corridor, in order to maximize benefits for neighboring communities and nature. Right, so we have that idea again. It's about building a park for the community and for nature um, all in one. Nothing new, but it's always worth shining a, a new light on. Um, in addition to our stakeholders that I mentioned, um, we have a key part of it is our many community partners. Um, so at the beginning, we reached out to a wide variety of organizations, public uh, individuals as well. Um, anyone who is interested in supporting the Burnham Wildlife Corridor and helping to preserve it, um, especially in the communities neighboring it. Um, we've built some really wonderful partnerships with the Chicago Chinese American Museum, um, Sacred Keepers, Sustainability Lab, uh, the American Indian Center, Open Lands, of course, there's some big ones in there, uh, Casa Michoacan, Southside Community Arts Center, um, and really the key is, again, these are going to be primarily organizations from those neighborhoods that sit immediately next to um, or have a lot of usage of this space, right? Kind of not just Chicago at large, really focusing in on the immediate people who live around it um, to help them feel a part of this park. Uh, and one of the coolest strat ways that we did this is we created the Roots and Routes gathering spaces. So on this map, you'll also notice 
um, a number of these little graphics. Um, and each one notes a separate artistic gathering space representing uh, one of those neighboring communities. So we have one for um, Far Western uh, Little Village, which has a lot of usage of this space, um, even though it is fairly far west compared to the other ones. Chinatown has a uh, gathering space, Pilsen, uh, and then Bronzeville, which of course sits right on the corridor, um, has two unique gathering spaces. And when I say by gathering space, I mean it's supposed to be a part of that community right here in nature. Um, and it's an artistic representation, I'll show you in a second, um, that allows an artist in that community to express how their community, their culture, their identity connects uniquely with nature. This is one of them, La Ronda Paracata. Um, it sits right on the south side of Margaret T. Burroughs uh, or 31st Street Beach. Um, La Ronda Paracata means um, the round of butterflies in both part in Spanish, La Ronda and Paracata, um, which is an indigenous word. Um, the people of Pilsen, uh, many of them have heritage uh, in Michoacan. Uh, and so there's this connection that uh, Hector Duarte and Alfonso Piloto Nieves saw um, of this migration of people from Michoacan to Chicago. And as you may or may not know, the migration of monarch butterflies, uh, which overwinter in Michoacan and fly up to Chicago and further north, right, and then back. So there's this way that the community connects with nature, um, with these kinds of wild spaces here in Chicago, um, and it goes right down to the roots of where they're originally, uh, you know, where the, their, their culture and their identity um, is from. Uh, an additional benefit to this is that when people care about a space and they feel that their identity is represented in a space, they want to take care of it. Uh, so we have a series of events that we allow them to, that, not allow them, but that they often will have at these spaces. This is from um, La Noche uh, de los Muertos event, uh, I think in 2017, maybe 16. Uh, and often these events are going to have a lot of stewardship. So they're not just uh, creating this artistic space, but they're going to help plant uh, and care for the wild areas around this gathering space. Um, this is another one um, set in stone representing Chinatown. It's based off of um, what's known as a scholar's rock, um, which is very typical of Chinese gardens. The idea is that you sit and you view an object like a rock like this, find inspiration, um, and just viewing and studying its nuances. Um, and you can do that, of course, in a Chicago environment. We don't have craggy rocks like this. We're not mountainous like China. Um, but of course, uh, you can do the same thing with anything in nature. You can sit and watch and meditate on it and find inspiration. Um, they host every year, uh, and hopefully we'll be doing a digital version of it this year, um, the Mid-Autumn Festival. Uh, I think this year will be on October 3rd. Uh, likewise, in addition to celebrating Chinese culture at this site and this um, important event, uh, they do a lot of stewardship there, right? They're going to care for that space um, and make it uh, an improved space. They do a lot of plantings, they bring in the general public, um, and it's a lot of fun. So in short, it's a really fun way to build identity, um, connect with the identity of these neighborhood uh, areas, right? Um, and build that engagement, get people involved, um, and get people caring for um, these natural areas. Uh, and feeling that it is something that is theirs, right? And this is important. It's not unique. Again, anyone can do it. Um, when people feel that they have uh, a little bit of possession of a natural area, uh, it means they want to care for it. Uh, and if they care for it, it's going to be a better natural area. Uh, uh, Ted, I'm going to have to ask you to finish up. All right. Sorry, I'm finishing up right here. Um, so if you'd like to take part in it, I have a link here. This year we're not doing it, but there are a wide variety of stewardship opportunities in the park district for anyone to do. Um, some are going to be at Burnham Park, uh, and I encourage you to do that. Uh, and if you uh, have other parks nearby that are doing them on the list they have on that link, uh, I encourage you to do those as well. All right, that's my time. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, yeah, thank you so much, uh, Ted. That was really that was really fascinating. Um, and thanks for sharing it. And if people have questions about that, um, you know, please put them in um, in the chat box. Uh, and, and now, uh, you know, what we what we often do is to ask um, other birders at the, in the area to just share a few photos that they have uh, taken. And so um, we're going to go first to Gustavo uh, Usteriz from Choose Honduras, and um, he's going to be uh, talking about two photos that he took. So um, uh, hopefully, hopefully uh, this you've got the photo there. <laughs> if not, someone should tell me, <laughs> and you can go ahead, uh, Gustavo. I think you can do full screen at the bottom. The little oh, screen at the bottom. Okay, bottom. I was afraid I didn't do that. Okay, all right, hold on. I will. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh, here we go. Okay, sorry about that. There we go. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, so thank you for the invitation. My name is uh, Gustavo, and uh, even though I have been uh, a very much into nature and to natural activities, uh, birding for me is a, a recent activity. Uh, I grew up uh, in the tropics on a farm in front of the Caribbean Sea, so everything was nature around me. And since moving to the Chicago region, it's sort of fascinating to be able to say that I will travel into a city for natural activities. To me, that's still very fascinating and new. So uh, I do most of the birding in Lake County since I live up here. and. Uh, been lucky enough to uh, have so many birders from uh, Lake and Cook County and let me tag along and ask tons of questions when we are out. And one comment is sometimes as a joke that a lot of people kept telling me was, you know, a lot of the times when you see a snowy owl, it will be out in a field and there is a possibility that you are going to confuse a plastic bag with a snowy owl. So people kept telling me that, you know, you need to be very careful and, and have a lookout. So this past February, when I started seeing reports that the snowy owl was at the 31st Street Harbor, I jumped on the opportunity to be able to come down and see it. And uh, I uh, parked my car and took out my scope and started walking. And, a few people were leaving the uh, beach at the moment and they mentioned that they had seen it uh, in the area so I, I was kind of excited about that and then I kept walking and I put my scope and started scanning the uh, the boat areas the boat dogs and there it was <laughs> I think I can say for a fact that I did not see a plastic bag <laughs> so that was very exciting uh, after taking that photo in the uh, in in the uh, dock area, I kept walking to towards the end where the uh, where the rock jetty starts, and I was able to see a second snowy owl that was way out in the distance. Uh, so that was a very exciting. This was a life bird for me. So uh, so very excited about that. And then when I was walking out, uh, if you can go to the next photo. Uh, I had an extra bonus that I was able to see a long-tailed duck there as well, uh, which I had only seen before in flight uh, going over the lake. Uh, so being able to see one up close and you know that's sort of like a pattern that they have in the face, it was also an, an interesting treat for me to see. So, so yeah, to me, it's a very interesting concept of driving into a city to see and enjoy nature. And definitely Chicago uh, has a bounty uh, of that available for for people visiting. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you, Gustavo. <laughs> That's a great story. Okay, we've got one more um, one more birder who's going to talk to us, and that is Claire Halpin. And uh, Claire actually works for Studio Gang, so she also is familiar. Uh, with the plan for Northerly Island because they're the ones who, who made up the plan for, for Northerly Island. But she's going to be talking to us as a birder uh, today. But if you do have questions um, about the plan, you can put those in the chat and she can uh, answer those as well. 
Uh, yeah, hi, and thanks for including me in this chat. It's really interesting to talk to everybody. Um, yeah, um, as Judy said, I'm, I'm, my day job is an architect at Studio Gang, and um, both in my work and personal life, I have a really big interest in ecology and nature and how it connects to uh, the built environment. Um, so uh, I'll just go quickly. I, I have a couple of photos from Northerly Island um, uh, and a couple from sort of more of the McCormick area. Um, uh, this one is of a uh, juvenile uh, hooded merganser in the, in the lagoon at Northerly. One of the things that's great about Northerly is all these different kind of areas now that there's sort of different terrains. So the, the pond on the one hand um, and juveniles I always find interesting because they're not as obvious to ID. So as I'm a learning birder, um, it's always just interesting and challenging to try to pick out what those features are. Um, and then the other one is, is just an American kestrel um, using one of the perches that was installed at Northerly um, uh, because the trees when they were planted are um, originally were quite small. And um, so these, I think, were provided to, um, to provide perching spots for, um, for raptors and kestrels. Um, and then the last one, it's actually just a short series of the same bird. It's a Cooper's hawk, um, kind of around the McCormick um, area. Um, and this was actually uh, March 15th of this year. So it was right before everything kind of shut down. Um, and little did we know at that point, but I was there sort of late on this Sunday, just as the sun was setting. And um, I've often seen hawks there. It's a pretty common occurrence to see uh, Cooper's hawk, um, but just super interesting. So it's nice, I mean, right along the bike path too. Um, in this case, they use the, you know, an interesting example of birds using built even built um, features like light poles um, to kind of scan around. And then it tried to get into a squirrel's nest, I think unsuccessfully, and then um, kind of followed it along the path. And you can see here the mulch, one of the mulch paths. It's really nice to kind of get off of the main, uh, you know, kind of high speed bike trail. That's one of the things that I really love about this whole area are those kind of meandering paths that take you from lakefront and then back into the kind of more savanna or prairie areas. Um, yeah, and that's all. Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, uh, thank you, Claire. So, uh, you know, it's actually 7.02. Um, so we went a little long, but we can st take a little time for questions. Uh, you know, we don't have to get out of the room or anything like that. So, um, uh, I want to just thank you uh, for for being with us uh, if you need to leave at seven, but um, hopefully we can just stay a little longer. There are, are hardly, there are just a very few uh, questions. So one is, uh, I think this has been answered, but I'm going to just ask it again. Uh, currently, there's no parking at Northerly Island and no parking at 31st Street. Is that correct? That's addressed to Ted. Yeah, no, there, you can get there on bike or foot. Uh, yeah, bike or foot. Yeah. And then uh, is the road to the aquarium permanently closed? I'd say it seems likely it will be closed for a while longer. It's pandemic related. Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, and then have snowy owls. This one's from Pat. Have snowy, snowy owls been seen every winter at Northerly Island? Does anybody know? They have not been seen every winter. Um, they're, they're erratic in their occurrence and there's some winters when they're none. And actually after they did the first round of restoration there, it, we, we went several years without snowy owls there. And it's like, oh, we made good habitat and the owls didn't like it. But, <laughs> but they've, come, they've come back and have been pretty regular. So most years there are snowy owls there but not every year. 
Okay, and then we've got uh, another 11 people that are watching on Facebook Live. So hi, uh, Facebook Live watchers. And a couple questions over there. Um, one is, are, are leashed dogs allowed in the Burnham Wildlife Corridor? And a corollary to that one, are dogs not recommended for birding? Um, I can't speak for birding. I can say at the BWC, uh, no, anywhere in the park district that are set aside for as bird sanctuaries, um, we try to, we ask you do not bring your dog. What about generally, anybody have some thoughts about whether it's a good idea to bring a dog birding? Um, a good idea is, I would say no, but I, having grown up in a family where we usually took our dog birding with us, it can be done. Um, the, you know, keeping it on the leash and, um, is, is an important part of that because they can, loose dogs can do, um, significant damage in some areas. Okay, and then um, I do just want to comment that I did put a link to the tip jar in the uh, chat in case anyone would like to make a donation. You know, obviously we're not for profit and we rely on your donations and appreciate all of your support. Um, I believe, um, okay, question for Doug. When will the state bird change to the red-headed woodpecker? <laughs> Great question. As I understand it, when hell freezes over, that will happen. Uh, <laughs> so, so we were going to have a discussion about the state bird at the Birding America last spring, but that got canceled because of the pandemic. And it's clear that red-headed woodpecker should be the state bird, but um, so far the powers that be have not seen the wisdom of that move. <laughs> Doug, if, yes, Doug if any year, if any year could uh, be the possibility <laughs> of a freeze over, I think 2020 is uh, is getting there. <laughs> really? <laughs> Maybe so. <laughs> oh, really? Okay, and then Cassie just wants us all to know that a dog is okay birding if it fits in a backpack. Uh, <laughs> and if you follow her, uh, you know she has a cute little dog. Um, oh, uh oh, and on our Facebook page, I have to say we've got a little controversy. Never, Cardinal always. So that's from Kim, uh, Kim Ruffin. <laughs> oh, well, Kim's wrong, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and then I think, um, I think that's it for the questions. We've got a bunch of uh, thank yous, uh, et cetera. So, and thank, um, thank you all for uh, participating. Uh, this was, this was great. I want to really thank our presenters um, for another fabulous uh, patch chat. And we will, uh, you know, we'll have this up. Um, it'll be on Facebook, so you can watch it on Facebook. And uh, in a few weeks, we'll get it up on our, our YouTube channel for people who, who missed it. And uh, we'll also link it on our, our webpage. So um, yeah, so I want to just really, really thank all of our presenters. It was a really wonderful, uh, interesting hour. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Right ahead, Woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs>